The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles need no introduction, but it would be awkward not to include a short overview, so here it goes. The four crime-fighting mutant turtles made their debut in a 1984 comic strip, which evolved into a blockbuster animated TV series, live-action films, a line of toys, and just about any kind of merchandise geared toward kids you could possibly think of. So since this phenomenon was taking place in the late 80s, an NES game was inevitable, and in 1989 we got one thanks to Konami. The storyline is pretty simple. The game's main antagonist, Shredder, has kidnapped a news reporter and companion of the Turtles, April O'Neil, and of course it's up to the Turtles to rescue her. The kidnapping plot may not be exactly original, but it branches out as each stage will advance the story a bit more. 90% of the game is a side-scrolling platformer, but there's also a main overhead map to take you to different portions of the stage, and in one case a swimming level. The four turtles, Leonardo, Michelangelo, Donatello, and Raphael, are all playable and can be switched during the game through the pause menu. Each turtle has its own life meter, so if one starts running low on health, you can change to a healthier turtle to help advance. Pizza replenishes health, and it comes in three forms. One slice will give you a slight increase, a half pizza will increase a half meter's worth, and a whole pizza replenishes your life completely. The pizza doesn't show up all that often, but when it does, you need to be sure you choose the right turtle to feed. Each turtle appropriately has its own weapons, each with different speed, range, and power. Leonardo's katana has pretty good range, slow speed, and average power. Raphael's Sai has weak range, average speed, and pretty good power. Michelangelo's nunchucks have good speed, average range, and weak power. And Donatello's bow staff has slow speed and excellent range and power. He's definitely the most useful. If he dies, you're in trouble. Each turtle also has a standing attack, overhead attack, and ducking attack. There are also some long distance weapons you'll find randomly after killing an enemy, but some are planted in specific locations. There's ninja stars which you can fire one or three at a time, depending on which ones you find. Then there's boomerangs which you can catch on the rebound and keep in your inventory. And scrolls which really rip some shit up. Each of these have 20 shots and you can toggle whether you want the long distance weapon or the standard weapon by pressing select. You can't swap these weapons between the turtles, although there is a trick where you can pause the game while a boomerang is in the air, switch turtles, and have them actually catch it and take all the boomerangs. Then there's this turtle head icon, which will make you invincible for a short period of time. When all four of your turtles are defeated, it's game over and you have two continues to pick up from the stage you left off at. Once in a while you can rescue a captured turtle, essentially awarding you an extra life if you lost one. But these spots are few and far between, so don't take them for granted. Also, when a turtle is initially captured, Splinter and April don't seem to give a shit. Leonardo got caught, who fights next? Jeez, you sound real disappointed. This text screen I'm talking about also pops up when you pause the game. From here you can read information or advice given by Splinter or April, switch your selected turtle, or view a map that shows your location in the overhead view. The overhead view is mainly to get from place to place, but you'll still encounter enemies, mostly foot soldiers and steamrollers, along with the occasional plane dropping bombs. The enemies throughout the side-scrolling portions are fucking weird. I'm guessing that these are the creatures that live in Dimension X, since we really never got to see much of what that place had to offer. Another weird thing is that these enemies will generate randomly in some areas. But some of them flock together with specific others. But how the hell do I explain it? Alright, here's an example. I walk into this building and there's these three midget astronauts, balloon things, and fire-breathing knights. These enemies stick together and the room will comprise of this group right here if I continue. But if I walk out and come back in, there'll be these four-legged eye aliens, fire guys, and robotic dragonflies, or whatever the hell they are. So it's not so much that the enemies themselves are random, but the collection of enemies are. I guess they've got their own cults or cliques or whatever. Anyway, controlling a turtle is pretty good, but because your sprite is so big and there are sometimes too many enemies on the screen at one time in multiple directions, you'll get some cheap hits. Not to mention that if you take a hit, you're sent backward and you think that you've got a brief moment of invincibility, but instead you just take some extra cheap-ass hits. Add to that some questionable hit detection and it'll equal some frustrating moments. The graphics are pretty good, not great, but definitely adequate. And the soundtrack is pretty badass too, although there isn't a huge selection of songs, you'll end up hearing some repeats. My personal favorite is the underwater stage, it fits the atmosphere perfectly. 
Strangely enough, this is actually the only song in the game that has elements from the Ninja Turtles theme song, and it's really only the main riff. But it does have plenty of original parts to it. In the sequel, Ninja Turtles 2 the arcade game, every single song in the whole fucking game has this riff in it somewhere, but I'm not going to talk about the music forever, especially since I'm trying to focus on the first game here. Keep in mind that throughout this walkthrough, I'll be going through it as if you had every single turtle alive. I'll point out where you can rescue captured turtles, but it'll just take too damn long to go over every single combination. Plus, the mini bosses are never the same either, so it would be like reviewing every Crosby, Stills, Nash, Young album, as well as the duo and trio albums if I went over everything. Fuck that. So the objective here in Area 1 is to save April. Walk right past the first sewer hole you see, it just leads to right over here. There's no point in going through all this garbage and possibly taking a few hits, unless you want to warm up or something. Watch out for the steamrollers though, if they make contact with you, you're dead instantly. You go into this next sewer, battle some all weak enemies, and encounter a mini boss, Bebop. He can only attack in close range with his bare hands, so use Donatello's bow and jump over him to keep him from cornering you. After finishing him off, Rocksteady will take April through the door above where you of course have to follow him. Going to this small building is pretty much a waste of time. There's some pizza in there which you might need if you have a dying turtle, but the problem is, even if you fight everything off okay and get the pizza at the end, when you turn around and go back, all the enemies regenerate. And it's such a tight, narrow area that it's hard to fend these assholes off. Especially when they fire projectiles that go right through your weapon and are hard to jump over due to the low ceilings, not to mention that you have to attack. Ugh. So you probably ought to just skip it altogether. And this sewer here is even more pointless. It's a dead end with nothing at the end except a mini boss. At least in the other building there was a pizza. You do get to try out the cool invincibility feature, but there's no reward for going this way, so skip this shit too. You wanna go down this one in the narrow streetway over the water. It's short, and there's a mini boss, but nothing to worry about. You'll come out the other side and into this building, which is also a short trip. Just go slow over the conveyor belts and let these boomerang jackasses fall below. Soon after, you'll face the main boss of the stage, Rocksteady. There's the infamous cheap stand on the top crate and attack him while he's ducking deal, but it's easy to beat him in the traditional sense anyway. He'll charge before jumping. When he does, jump over him in the opposite direction and attack from behind. His secondary attack is a simple single bullet, even though his weapon looks like it's definitely an automatic. After defeating him, you'll have rescued April, and she informs you that the Foot Clan plans to blow up a dam, so stopping them is the objective of Area 2. Now look at this map in comparison to Area 1. It's a lot smaller, isn't it? Wonder if that's just a trick to make you think it's shorter, but this one area you go in takes 5 years to get out of. Nope, this building is pretty short too. Standard sewer enemies from level 1, a couple mini bosses, 3 floors up, and you're on top of the dam just like that. Only part you really have to watch out for is this jump right before the exit. It's short, but the ceiling might knock you back down if you don't time it right, making you go back through the field of regenerated enemies all over again. There's also a mini boss guarding a whole pizza if you skip past the ladder on the third floor. So once you get to the top of the dam, walk off the edge where the railing is broken and it's onto the swimming stage. You have 2 minutes and 20 seconds to defuse 8 bombs or the dam blows up and it's game over. The most common hazards are all the electrical currents that go on and off. Wait for each one to stop before crossing and don't cross two at a time unless they're real close to each other. They don't stay off for too long and you're pretty slow at swimming, at least when taken off. So the first bomb is obvious, it's right in front of you. You can always pause the game and April will give you tabs on how many bombs are left. How she's communicating with you, I have no fucking clue. But anyway, swim up the gap and you'll find the next bomb. Go back down and continue on, making sure that you don't make contact with the seaweed or you're done for. I guess that's some strong ass seaweed. So you'll run on, defuse another bomb, and then run into this rotating metal wheel contraption. Swim straight up when you see an opening and defuse the bomb to your immediate left, making sure not to touch the pink poison plants. Swim back to the right and defuse the bomb after the two currents. Then swim back up and you'll have to deal with the infamous string of poison plants. You'll need to really take your time with this part, and you're probably going to take damage no matter what, so if you have to, switch turtles when your energy starts getting low, preferably with Mike and Raph, as they have the least effective weapons. You'll come to a fork up here. Keep going straight, defuse the bomb, go back and head down. Defuse the bomb you see to the right of this current, and you're down to one final bomb, which of course is behind all this fucking seaweed and poison plants. Make your way through it slowly, and you've beaten the level.